Dawa Center presents The End of Music by Sheikh Amal al-Makki Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah Amma ba'd The End of Music This is a message for our believing brothers and sisters in Iman Who are afflicted with listening to music Or were confused by statements of scholars who said that it was permissible this is a message for our brothers and our sisters who listen to music and their hearts have become attached to it and their emotions were moved and they were swayed by it. But we have no doubt that there are believers who long for paradise and love Allah and want to come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. They are our brothers and our sisters, our uncles and our parents who have been temporarily defeated by the shaitan but we know that they inshaAllah can defeat him multiple times. What can I say about music and where do I begin? It has affected the hearts and swayed people away from the straight path and it has caused the religion to take the back seat. It has caused people's addiction to the point where they left the Qur'an and abandoned the masajid. What can I say about music? If you ask someone the simplest question about the Prophet wasallam, they cannot respond. If you ask them about the mothers of the believers, their own mothers, they could not even tell you their names. If you ask them about the Prophets of Allah or the companions of Allah anhum ajma'in, they cannot respond to your questions. But they can tell you about individuals who sing and curse all day and produce the worst messages for our youth, offering nothing positive to their communities or to the environment. They can tell you about those people and their childhood and where they grew up and who they married and who they're dating and what year they put out their albums. There is one study that says the youth from between the ages of 15 and 20, they listen to about 26.8 hours of music per week. About 27 hours of music per week. And those who are 55 and older, they listen to about 13 hours of music per week. And now with it being available online for free and many devices that can carry thousands and thousands of songs, you can expect these numbers to increase. The sad part, brothers and sisters, is that any time someone commits a sin, he is using the blessing given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. And the sad thing is that we're going to be asked about all the blessings and how we use them on this earth. And hearing is one of the greatest of the blessings given to us. And Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us about what we listen to on this earth. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Inna sama wal basar wal fuad." Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Verily the hearing and the sight and the heart You will be questioned by Allah About all of these things And so the righteous then They have recognized that the shaitan is their enemy And they stayed away from the path that lead to the shaitan When Allah azza wa jal commanded Iblis alayhi la'natullah To prostrate to Adam Iblis refused and disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he vowed that he's going to misguide all human beings. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to Iblis some of the ways that in which he's going to use people and to take people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah azza wa jal tells him, وَاسْتَفْسِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكْ وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجْلِكْ وَشَارِكْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَعِدُهُمْ وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا in this verse, Allah Azza wa Jal tells the shaitan, and befool them gradually, those whom you can amongst them, with your voice. So what do you think would be the voice of the shaitan? And right now these verses that we're going to mention, they do not say anything about music being haram, but you start to see a kind of music being put in a bad light. But these verses are not saying that it's haram so far. But so far now we're seeing that the, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the shaitan, Guide whom, misguide whomever you can from humanity with your voice. So what is this voice? It includes songs and music and anything else. It is very general term. Anything else that calls to the disobedience to Allah or calls anything away from Allah. So not just music, but this is a general term. And make assaults on them with your cavalry and infantry. And this also incur, in, includes when someone is walking with their own feet to something that is haram or something that's prohibited and share with them wealth and children wealth meaning tempt them to earn their money in illegal and haram ways and their children by getting people to try to commit illegal 
uh, or illicit sexual activity and make promises to them but shaitan promises them nothing but deceit so we're still not saying or showing ayat or evidences that it's haram but we're starting to show that it's one of the tools of the shaitan and before we get to the sayings of the sahaba radiallahu anhum and the evidence from the quran and the sunnah and the great scholars and the imams we want to look at some logical evidence that will tell you there is probably something wrong with music and that it's probably not halal. Just from looking at it from a distance and analyzing it, we're going to see that it's something that's not surrounded with good and it's probably something that's not halal. Because I believe that every good Muslim knows deep down in their heart that music is haram. Perhaps some of us don't want to face that reality, but deep down they know that it's haram. And this is illustrated in this story where a man came to the companion Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma and he said Ya ibn Abbas أرأيت الغناء أحلال هو أم حرام Oh ibn Abbas this music, this singing is it halal or haram? and here al-ghina specifically is singing so what is he asking about? he is asking about the ghina, the singing of the Arab the Bedouin Arabs and their singing this is singing that does not include talking about fornication or homosexuality. It does not show people dancing or videos, people يعني, wearing, uh, I'm ashamed to say it, but you know, wearing bikinis or things of that sort or using bad words. So he's asking about this. Is this permissible? So Ibn Abbas tells him, He says, do you see the truth and falsehood when they come forth on the day of judgment? Which side do you think? music will be on you think it will be on the side of truth on the side of the prophets on the side of the quran and dhikr and psalm and salah and allah azza wa jal or it will be on the side of falsehood so the man said yakunu ma'al batil that it will be with falsehood so ibn abbas says فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ اِذْهَبْ فَقَدْ أَفْتَيْتَ نَفْسَكْ he tells him what is besides the truth meaning if it's not the truth it's falsehood go you have answered your own question by yourself. So the man knew the answer by himself, and I believe that we all know the answer. So let's look at just some of the logical evidences. We find that halal things and good things, they generally have good descriptions and good attributes. When you look at prayer, you look at fasting, reciting the Quran, when people gather to pray, generally good things happen in these gatherings. It's a good gathering. When people gather to recite the Qur'an, it's a good gathering. And you don't find it being surrounded by things that are haram. But things that are haram are usually surrounded with things that are haram. And look at the things that surround music. Whenever people gather around music, there are typically not gatherings of righteous people. You don't typically see the imam of the masjid in that gathering and the mashayikh and the mufti of the, of the city. You don't find righteous people typically. And you find intermingling and women with their hair uncovered and women who are poorly dressed and you will find alcohol and dancing and smoking and that night usually ends with the sin of zina, fornication billah. So this is the first indication then that it's haram because it's always accompanied and surrounded with things that are haram. The second indication then, and still without going into any of the hadith, is the feeling that you get from music. It does not bring you closer to Allah. Even the biggest music lover, get a Muslim who is the biggest music lover, he will not be pleased if he hears rap music in the masjid. Why? Because he knows this is not a feeling you're supposed to get in the masjid. We're talking about someone who is the biggest music lover in the community. If he enters the Jum'ah, and he finds the imam up on the member with a big uh, boom box then the imam hits play and then a funky beat comes over and then the imam starts to freestyle yes the biggest music lover in the audience will become upset and offended why because they know this is something that is totally opposite of the feeling that he came to get he came to be reminded of Allah Azza wa Jal and to listen to the ayat and the Quran and the ahadith which take him in one direction but the feeling that you get from music takes you in the opposite direction. And that's why many many years ago the early scholars of Islam they used to say that music and the Quran cannot be combined in the heart of the believer. 
There's not enough room in your heart for both of them. You either love one or the other. And like I said, you try that and test that when you get in someone's vehicle. You find they either have music tapes or they have Quran tapes. They listen to one or the other. And the Quran, it takes you in a direction where it prevents you from following your desires. And it commands chastity and it commands modesty. And it controls these desires and prevents you from following the steps of the shaitan. And music takes you in a direction that's totally opposite. So of the feelings that music causes, it causes people uh, to feel less shame. They feel a lack of shame and they're less shy. And they're not embarrassed, male or female. You see when there's loud music played, they're not very embarrassed to jump up and down and twirl and fall on the ground and get up again. They're not embarrassed to do that. And the women are not embarrassed to do that. Have you ever heard of a female dancer who was too shy because there were men in the room? She said, I don't want to dance, there's too many men watching me. Or I'm not dressed properly, I'm not covered right. Rarely is it associated with haya. You, rarely is it associated with these feelings of iman. But you find these people, they don't care. And notice how, when people repent, and they come back to Allah, they usually stop going to nightclubs and parties. Why is that? Because they know these are bad places, and these places are also associated with music. The second thing concerning the, the feeling that you get from music is that it causes this fitna, it causes this, uh, it arouse, arouses desires, the sexual desires in people. And even the fitna of the voice of women. And so it's not just enough that the voice of women is enough to stir emotions in a man, but now these female singers, they're purposely making their voice softer and they're dancing in ways that are sexually suggestive and they're not wearing proper clothing. So what do you expect? Except that the man's heart is going to be moved by that. And his feelings are going to be moved by that. And this is something that even Christians are aware of. There's a church called the Church of Christ. That's it. That's the name of it. And they don't have, they don't believe in music in church. They don't believe in dancing. They look at it as sexually suggestive. And it's so surprising and shocking when Muslims see that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this type of behavior. When we look at the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says for the women, وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِأَرْجُلِهِنَّ لِيَعْلَمَ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنَّ وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Here Allah is saying to the women that they should not strike their feet in order to draw attention to their hidden ornaments. So forget the voice, the soft voice of the woman while she's shaking her hair from left and right and dancing and singing and jumping up and down. Allah is forbidding the Muslim women who are covered from head to toe to not strike their feet in a loud way on the ground so that their ankle bracelets and whatever ornaments they're wearing will shake and make that sound and men will just know. They will not see anything. They will just know that this woman is adorned with these things. If Allah is preventing this voice, what about then the woman coming and telling, you know, saying sweet things and sweet words? Yeah? طيب. So, the music also then, the effects of it, it can move you in various ways. There was an, uh, an Arab musician, his name was Al-Farabi. This is from the early Muslims or from the past generations. And it is said that he would play his instrument and sing in a certain way and the listeners would cry. And then he would play and sing in a certain way and then the people would laugh. And then he would play and sing in a certain way and the people would sleep and then he would walk out. So do not tell me that it does not affect people's behavior or how they act. And on a final note on the feelings, which is better for you and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is better for your heart and strengthens your iman? Definitely it's the Qur'an and it's not listening to something like music. So how can it be the case? And how can we know this answer and yet people listen to more music than they do to the Qur'an? What about then the message that you get from songs? And now here specifically I'm talking about things that you hear like the, the MTV type of mainstream pop culture music and even you know if you want to consider the music that's played in the Muslim lines generally we're not talking about uh, nasheed that calling you to Allah. We're talking about the things that the majority of young men and women listen to. Predominantly this type of music that they listen to. What are the messages that come out of that? 
Have you ever heard one of these singers warning from alcohol or calling people to hijab or calling to righteousness? But they sing about zina and when they sing about love, are they talking about a man loving his wife? They're always talking about a love that is for, forbidden. And this is from Isha'at al-Fahisha. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Here Allah Azza wa is saying, those who love to see scandal published or broadcast amongst the believers will have grievous penalty or punishment in this life and the next. So again, let's think about what this ayah is saying. Allah Azza wa is saying, those who would love, not those who do it, not those who are pushing for it, those who would love for the evil deeds to spread, they are the ones getting this punishment. And they just wanted to see that. Not those who are actively involved. So what are these messages from these songs telling us? And for that reason, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion radiallahu anhu, he used to say, Al-Ghina, Ruqyatu Zina. What does it mean, Ruqyatu Zina? It means it is the way and the facilitator of fornication, of Zina. And this is him speaking about the songs and the, and the music in his time when a servant girl would sing and she would not dance and she would not do it publicly and she would not call to fornication nor talk about it. But yet it is called Ruqya to Zina. It is mentioned by the scholar Ibn Qudama. He mentioned in a Tawabin that a righteous man passed by a house and he heard a woman singing inside. And so what happened? He was walking by, but he slowed down a little bit so he can hear this woman. And so the owner came out and he said, Do you want to come in to listen? So the man said, He said, A'udhu Billah. We seek refuge from Allah. So the man tells him, he insisted, Come inside and just listen. So the man says, He let me sit in a place where I can't see her and she can't see me. So there is now a hijab between them, uh, like a partition between them. So then the man entered and she sang for him and she beautified her voice and she softened her voice and she used the weapon of the shaytan. So then the owner of the house tells him, would you like me to remove the sitr, the partition between you and her? So I said, the man said no, because he was a righteous man. So he insisted until he removed the partition, until he saw her. And so he combined the fitna of hearing and the fitna of seeing. And... That continued until he was completely overtaken with her. And so this righteous man then would come every day to listen to her. Until one day she told him, Wallahi, I love you. So he said, I couldn't keep a straight face there. <laughs> she said, Wallahi, I love you. So he said, and I also love you. You see? And she called him to zina. And she said, what would prevent you? The place is empty. And he was shaken. And he said, Bala. He said, yes, the place is empty. وَلَكِنِّي لَا آمَنْ أَنْ أُفَاجَأُ بِالْقَضَاءِ And I, I, I'm not, I do not feel safe that I would not be surprised with the qada of Allah, the decree of Allah that I might die right now. ثُمَّ بِجَمْرٍ كَالْغَضَى ثُمَّ بِصِيَاطٍ وَزَقُّومٍ وَتَهْوِيلٍ وَرُجُومٍ so he starts to mention the punishment, punishments of the Day of Judgment. He says, I'm not sure that that won't happen to me. And he went away weeping and he never returned. <coughs> but look at how the shaitan almost destroyed this man. And how many young men have become attached to female singers and when they hear their voices or see their pictures, their hearts begin to race. And how many young women have posters of men in, in, in their pictures in their bedrooms and in their rooms and so we see the effect of singing on women in particular Yazid ibn al-Walid he used to say Ya Bani Umayyah he's giving advice to Bani Umayyah إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغِنَى فَإِنَّهُ يُذْهِبُ الْحَيَاءَ وَيَزِيدُ الشَّهْوَةَ وَيَهْدُمُ الْمُرُوءَةَ وَإِنَّهُ لَيُنُوبُ عَنِ الْخَمْرَ وَيَفْعَلُ مَا يَفْعَلُهُ السُّكْرُ فَإِن كُنْتُمْ لَا so he's saying, O Bani Umayyah, you know, Iyakum wal ghina, stay away from singing. Because it will take the modesty, the shyness away from people. And it will increase the desires of the lusts of people. وَيَهْدُمُ الْمُرُوءَ will take away like the, like the manlihood of people. وَإِنَّهُ لَيُنُوبُ عَنِ الْخَمَرِ Like it can replace 
it can take the place of khamr, of alcohol, meaning it can cause this kind of intoxication in the mind. وَيَفْعَلُ مَا يَفْعَلُهُ السُّكُرُ And it can do what alcohol can do to people. فَإِن كُنْتُمْ لَا بُدَّ فَاعِلِينَ If you're really going to do it, there's no other way. فَجَنِّبُوهُ nisa. Then keep it away from women. At least go and do not let the women hear this. فَإِنَّ الْغِنَاءَ أَدَاعِيَةُ الزِّنَا Singing, this is one of the, the callers to fornication. Also the Khalifa Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, he heard someone singing. So he was upset. He heard someone singing at night. So in the morning he had the person or these singers gathered and they brought them to him. So he tells them, إِنَّ الْفَرَسَ لَيَصْحَلْ فَتَسْتَوْدِقُ لَهُ الرَّمَكَ That meaning that when the male horse makes his sound, the female horse prepares to mate. وَإِنَّ الْفَحْلَ لَيَهْدِرْ فَتَبَّعُ لَهُ النَّاقَ And the camel also he makes the sound and the she-camel gets ready for him. وَإِنَّ التَّيْسَ لَيَنِبْ فَتَسْتَحْرِمُ لَهُ الْعَنْزِ And the, 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 the same thing also with the sheep or the goat. Uh, the, male, the, the male goat makes the sound and she, the, the female also gets prepared for him. وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلُ لَيَتَغَنَّى فَتَشْتَاقُ لَهُ الْمَرْأَى and the man would sing and then the woman would long for him. And then he ordered them to be taken away from the area. But actually, he actually first ordered them to be punished most severely. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the scholar, was there and he told them that that is not like a, pro, uh, a prescribed punishment. So he had them only sent away to another area. So this is the effect that male singers can have on the women. He had a very nice voice and he would recite poetry in a very nice rhythmic and melodious way. And this would also help the camels as they would travel. And it would make the, the, for, the, for the camels, it would make them easier for them, this beat, this rhythm that they would walk to. The Prophet ﷺ told Anjasha to, to begin to, to make these, like this singing or this recitation. And it was a very nice voice. And then the Prophet ﷺ feared for the women at the end of the caravan. So he said, Ya Anjasha, Ruaydaka Ya Anjasha, Rifqan Bil Qawarir. He said, Ya Anjasha, it's time to stop. It's enough now out of fear for Al Qawarir, which are, which are glass bottles. But he, he, he likened the women to that because they're delicate. So why did the Prophet ﷺ stop him? Because it would have a bad effect on the hearts of women. When they hear this man with the beautiful voice. Because it affects people like that. Also there was a man, his name was Ma'mar ibn, or Ma'mar ibn Muthanna. He narrates about the poet uh, Al-Hutayya his name was. And he was traveling with his daughters. And he came near to a people from Bani Kalb, the tribe of Bani Kalb. So they feared and that he would dislike something he sees from them and he might attack them with his poetry. So this man Al-Hutayya, he was known for attacking people with his words and his poetry. And if he attacked you, it became popular and it was kind of recorded against you. And he was so famous for this that one day he found nobody to attack. He attacked his own mother in his poetry. And it gets worse than that. One day he really wanted to attack somebody. He couldn't find anybody. So he looked in the mirror and saw the reflection of his face and started to write poetry cursing his own face. So you can imagine now why they were so afraid of this man. So they came to him and they said, tell us what you like so we can do it. And what you hate so we can stay away from it. We don't want to make you upset. So this man, he said to them, do not la ta'tuni kathiran fatamalluni. So do not visit me too much. You'll get bored of me. وَلَا تُسْمِعُونِ أَغَانِ شَبِيبَاتِكُمْ فَإِنَّ الْغِنَى رُقْيَةُ الزِّنَى He said, do not let me hear the songs of your young men and women because singing is one of the, like, the facilitators to zina. And what he meant was, I have my daughter with me on this trip and I would not like her to hear that. And I'm not going to read you the examples of lyrics uh, from contemporary music today or from hip-hop or rap, whatever they call you. The reason I'm not going to do that is I'm too ashamed to do that. Because they really talk about extremely, extremely filthy things. And bad words left and right. And even if there were no sisters in the room, I would be too ashamed to recite to you some of the lyrics that are being said in today's music. But the people know, uh, a lot of people are very familiar with the explicit 
type of music and the themes that they're talking about. And we, as we mentioned, they're never righteous things. It's always the worst of behavior that they're calling you to. So then what about now we discuss the message. So what about the, the writers of this message? What is the message that the writers of musical lyrics are trying to get across to you? What are they writing about? And who writes these words? Are they scholars, upstanding individuals, righteous men and women? You look at heavy metal, it's you know usually sex, drugs, devils and killing yourself. And I know I'm generalizing. Rap, it's sex, drugs, murder, garden tools and how many garden tools that you have. You understand? Degrading women, talking about you know pimping and things that are so embarrassing to mention. Blues, it's about hard times, broken hearts and being broke yourself. Country music, my truck broke down, my dog ran away, and I have <laughs> and I have a broken heart as well. So, are the writers of these songs people that you would like to get advice and words of wisdom from? What is Puff Diddy attempting to tell you in his lyrics? What would you get advice from someone whose name is Snoop Doggy Kelb? <laughs> Snoop Doggy Kelb. So. And would you take advice from me today, Kamal al makki if I was sitting here dressed in baggy and sagging pants and I had a grill in my mouth and I was cursing, would you accept advice from me, any kind of advice from me? So why do people then listen to the lyrics of these people and accept their advice? So someone might argue that this doesn't affect me. You know, I listen to this music, it's just entertainment and it doesn't affect me. And someone like that, I would ask, have you ever been to a high school? When you enter a high school today and you look at people, can you... Just from how they dress, identify those who listen to heavy metal and punk rock just from how they dress. And those who listen to hip hop just from how they dress. And who are the people who are called the goths or listen to... Isn't that a subculture that is related to gothic music? And cases of suicides from listening to songs. You might remember in the 80s there was a, a, a lawsuit against a man, Ozzy Osbourne, because uh, you know some kid listened to his song and he shot himself, he committed suicide. I mean, whether or not he told them to do so, but the point is, some people are affected by these kinds of things. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu, the Khalifa, he wrote to the Mu'addib, the, the tutor of his sons. The Mu'addibin would teach poetry and refined manners and things of that sort. So he wrote to him saying, let your first lesson to them be the hatred of musical instruments that begin with the shaitan and end with the wrath of Allah. For it reached me from the people of knowledge that listening to music and songs grows hypocrisy in the heart the same way water causes plants to grow. So with that we say to the one who listens to music, O oh Muslim, lawful things have good attributes. Where is the good in singing, dancing and listening to flutes? Can we compare the words of singers and sounds of musicians to the glorious Qur'an, its lessons, wisdoms and admonitions? How many singers do you know and give admiration? And how many do you know of the companions and the following generation? How much do you spend on singers from your dollars compared to how much you know of Islamic scholars? Do you see how much is memorized of music songs while you ignore the book to which memorization belongs? How much do you memorize of these incantations and sway back and forth in intoxication? Have you not seen those who follow the misguided and increase the loudness of the music when they should hide it? And who writes these songs, thinkers or men of academia or maybe scholars like Ahmad Malik or maybe Ibn Taymiyyah? All you who listen to music, don't you see that all the songs of the world and all the lyrics you've seen wouldn't compare in reward to Alif Lam Mi? It replaces the Qur'an, brothers and sisters. It replaces the Qur'an in people's hearts. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said to his, son, his sons, al ghina." I warn you of singing three times. No one listens to it except that Allah will cause him to forget the Quran. And people listen to music and they can cry. And they listen to the Quran and they don't cry. And they can stand for hours on their feet at a concert. But if the tarawih gets a little bit too long, they cannot bear it. One scholar asked someone, which does Allah, Allah love more, Qur'an or music? And the man said, Qur'an. He said, then why do not you, why don't you love what Allah loves more? What is your reason for that? There's a question from the greatest website in the world. Anyone know what that is? 
islamqa.com you've heard that before huh? look at this question I'm not going to read the answer or anything but just look at the way this person framed this question he said I'm a person who believes in the existence of Allah no matter how far I stray from Allah I turn back to him with humbleness but I listen to classical music and I think that it is the best thing in my life it does not provoke desire rather it helps me review myself and my mistakes I, felt that it's, I feel that Islam is a backward religion when I hear those who say that all kinds of music are haram. Just look at this question. And the Sheikh tells him, you said it's the best thing in your life. And you didn't mention Allah, and you didn't mention the Quran, and you didn't say Islam was the best thing in your life. Look at how it takes over people's lives, people. And he says, it helps me review myself and my mistakes. So the Sheikh said to him, you obviously, it didn't help you review this mistake when you wrote it. And he tells me, you feel Islam is a backward religion just because of this. So you see how much now it takes over people's lives and their hearts. And so they defend it and they tell you, well, it calms you down and it relaxes your nerves. So which calms you down and relaxes your nerves? That or when you have a calamity, you listen to a music or you run and you rush to Allah Azza wa Jal and you beg and you cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran, الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب those who believe and whose hearts find satisfaction in the remembrance of Allah for without doubt in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find satisfaction and as some scholars argue if music really made you you know a more refined person and more gentle and calms your nerves and so on and so forth if it did soften the hearts then the hearts of the musicians would be the best of hearts and their attitude and behavior would be the best. But what do we find as a reality? That they are the people who behave the worst. So that means it can't be something that gets you to behave better. So, before we even started to look at the ayat and the hadith, we saw that it was surrounded with haram. The people involved with it and the people who write it are not amongst the righteous and many times they're from the dissolutes and their messages are not good and the effects of music are not good and the effects of music uh, bring, do not bring you closer to Allah and the worst thing is that it replaces the Quran and it takes up so much of people's time as we looked at the numbers and generally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make halal for us everything that is good and he will make haram for us everything that is bad يُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ and so you'll find anything that is khabith, anything that is bad or impure, will be at some point or another prohibited or disliked in Islam. And so under this ayah you can easily put something like cigarettes. No one will say, you know, cigarettes are from the tayyibat. They're definitely from the khaba'i. And so they would fall under this ayah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, and it is a Sahih hadith. He said, there will be amongst my ummah people who permit لَيْكُنَنَّ مِنْ أُمَّتِي أَقْوَامٌ يَسْتَحِلُّونَ الْحِرَى وَالْحَرِيرِ وَالْخَمْرَ وَالْمَعَازِفِ There will be people from my ummah who permit four things. يَسْتَحِلُّونَ means literally they make halal. الْحِرَى which is uh, adultery or fornication and silk and alcohol and musical instruments. This is a sahih hadith in the book of Bukhari. So the first thing is the Prophet ﷺ said يَسْتَحِلُّونَ which means they make halal. Which means that the things he's about to mention, they're all haram. Otherwise he wouldn't say they make it halal, if it was already halal. And the word used in the hadith was, is ma'azif, which literally means musical instruments. And this includes, it's a general term, and includes all kinds of musical instruments. And as the... As with the ayat that we heard, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهُوَ الْحَدِيثِ لِيُذِلَّ بِهِ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ وَيَتَّخِذُهَا هُزُوَا And Allah Azza wa is saying, and of mankind is he who purchases idle talk to mislead people from the path of Allah without knowledge. And so, by way of mockery, for such there will be a humiliating torment. This is in Surah Luqman. So here in this verse then, it is not a clear indication that music is haram. But again, it's being mentioned in a bad light in the Qur'an. 
But then we see what, how the companions and the early Muslims and the scholars of Islam understood this word lahw al-hadith, which could be idle talk. So the majority of the mufassireen, they say that lahw al-hadith in this verse refers to singing. And another group said that it is every kind of sound dealing with entertainment, and which includes flutes and stringed instruments and so on. And in Tafsir al-Tabari, the scholar of the Ummah of Abdullah ibn Abbas says that this means singing. And Mujahid, rahimahullah, also says this means playing the, the drum, the tabl. And Al-Hasan al-Basri says that this ayah was revealed concerning singing and musical instruments. So these are all great scholars and this is how they understood this verse. And one of the, one of the more recent scholars, Al-Sa'di rahimahullah, said that this includes all manner of haram speech. So... We're starting to see in summary that either it refers to just singing and music or any false thing that leads you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala including lying, backbiting or including music and singing. But of the other scholars also, uh, Ibn Qayyim said the interpretation of the Sahaba, the companions and the generation after them that lahu al-hadith refers to singing is sufficient, he's saying. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was asked what does it mean lahu al-hadith and he swore by Allah walladhi la ilaha illa huwa in, innahu al-ghina three times walladhi la ilaha illa huwa innahu al-ghina walladhi la ilaha illa huwa innahu al-ghina and this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who says that I took 30 suwar fresh from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he has spoken the truth even if he does not swear to us and repeat it three times and it was also re, re, uh, re, يعني, related or narrated that with a sahih uh, isnad chain of narration that Ibn Umar also said that this ayah is referring to singing. So whether or not you want to argue that this ayah now is saying it's haram or not, it's just mentioning it in a bad light, we find that the majority of the mufassireen and the early Muslims and the, and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ are saying that this is talking about music. And so look at the names that the Muslims had for music they didn't call it musiqa as they do now in Arabic. They didn't call it art and all these fancy names that we give it. These are the names that Muslims used to refer to music. They would call it al-lahu, al-lahu, al-batil, al-zur, al-muka, al-tasdiya, ruqyatu al-zina, Qur'an al-shaytan, munbitu al-nifaq fi al-qalb, al-sawt al-ahmaq, al-sawt al-fajr, sawt al-shaytan, mazmur al-shaytan, and al-sumud. They would call it vain talk, false talk, falsehood the facilitator of fornication, the way of fornication, the Qur'an of the shaitan, the flute of the shaitan, the sound of the shaitan, the immoral sounds. These were the names that people had for music. And when you look at what people used to call something, it gives you an indication of how they felt about it when it was first introduced to them. For example now, in, in a lot of Arabs, they refer to the singer as a fanan. Fanan is a singer. And the, fanan, the word fanan, literally, it, it refers to a donkey. It's, it's a donkey that is striped, which is like a zebra. So that means when the Muslims started to see all these singers, they gave them a name that was befitting and they called them donkeys. Also like the, the theater in Arabic is referred to as the masrah. The theater is called the masrah. Masrah is the place where the animals like gather and eat and, and relieve themselves and things of that sort. That means also when the righteous Muslims first saw people on stage and acting silly, they said, well, these people are acting like animals, and they called the, say, the, the theater, the stage, the masrah, where the animals fool around. And also you find the early Muslims used to call male singers, the male singer was called the muhannaf. This is someone who was a, an effeminate type of man. Someone who, you know, is, you know, flaky. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ said two sounds are accursed in this world and the next. A sound of musical instruments in a time of happiness and a sound of wailing during a calamity. And we're going to look at some of these ahadith more uh, in, in the next talk insha'Allah. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا And those who do not witness the, like the falsehood and if they pass by some evil talk or evil play they pass by it with dignity, meaning it does not affect them. So Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, and who can tell us who is Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya? Naam. The son of Ali radiallahu anhu, and he was not his son from Fatima, so he was referred to as ibn al-Hanafiya. 
they, he was asked, what is a zur that we just mentioned in this verse? He said, إِنَّهُ الْغِنَى لِأَنَّهُ يَمِيلُ بِكَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ He said, it's singing because it diverts you away from the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah Azza wa says in the Qur'an to the kuffar of Quraysh, أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَضْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says like you marvel from this speech and you laugh and you do not cry وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ Ibn Abbas said سَامِدُونَ means مُغَنُّونَ that you're singing the Arabs used to say اسْمُدْ لَنَا meaning غَنِّي لَنَا sing for us and this is uh, you know, meaning that when the Quraysh would, the, the Prophet وسلم, or the Muslims would recite Quran they would drown out the verses of the Qur'an by their singing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes them here. So when we say then that it is haram, we're accused of being backwards, people who are against art and creativity. But really in music, it has wasted the time of our young men and women with hours and hours of listening to it and following the news of those who create it. And they have not learned their religion, nor have they learned any other sciences and have not even become involved in politics. I have visited one country in Eurasia and the government there, part of their policy is to keep the youth occupied with music constantly. There is absolutely nothing on their television except music all night and day. And the only time that is interrupted is to show them a movie. Music all the time. And so it is very disheartening and very sad that all the youth, the young men and women, the only thing they care about is this musician and he divorced so and so and this one has a new album out and that's all they think about. And they're not involved in anything that helps them better their life or their society or their country. And so music begins with the shaitan and it ends with the anger of Ar-Rahman and it moves people to ugly things and it decreases your haya. And so you see people, they clap and they move up and down and they scream and they spin and they're not ashamed and we seek refuge and the protection of Allah from these things. Some of the early Muslims used to say singing brings hypocrisy in people and inad, that they stu- become stubborn and kadib, lying and riqqa, which is mu'a, which is when uh, the man is not like, you know, um, manly or like, you know, hard anymore. Becomes soft and he becomes softened by this. So we look at some of the opinions and the, of the companions and the scholars of Islam. And the companions, there are some issues that the Sahaba disagreed upon. So you can choose this side or that side. But on the issue of music, they did not disagree once. There is no disagreement of the companions. They have ijma' on this issue. Consensus that this thing, that music was haram. There was not any companion who said that it's okay. And anyone who says so, we challenge them to bring us proof of any one companion who said that it's okay. Ibn Mas'ud held that listening to musical instruments give birth to disbelief and hypocrisy in the heart. Ibn Abbas said it's haram. Ibn Mas'ud, Jabir ibn Abdullah, not single, a single one of them said that it's okay. And of the four imams, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa is the strictest in this regard. And his comments and the comments of his students are the harshest. He says, I mean the, the points are, his companions, and by that mean that the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, they clearly stated that it's haram to listen to all musical instruments. And they said the person who listens to them is a fasiq. Fasiq is someone who is a dissolute, someone who lacks moral restraint, or a rebellious evildoer, whose testimony should be rejected. So just for listening uh, to Jay-Z, we do not accept your testimony anymore. And they also said that music and listening to music and enjoying it is kufr. Now they said it's kufr but they based that on a weak hadith. So we're not saying what they say but it just shows you to what extent, to what extent the Hanafis went. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, Al-ghina min akbar al-dhunub allati yajibu tarkuha fawran. He said that singing is one of the, 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 the biggest sins that someone needs to leave immediately. And Imam Malik, when asked about, not when asked about singing, he was asked about people who said singing was permissible. He said, 
ما يفعله عندنا إلا الفساق. No one would do that except someone who is a dissolute. And it is only the sin people, sinful people who do that. And the scholars say this was also based on the view of the people of Medina. Meaning, the people who lived in the city of Medina, and just a few generations ago they have seen the Prophet ﷺ and the, or the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and how they lived and behaved. So that means they were upon this view as well, because they never saw the companions of the Prophet ﷺ accepting something like that. Imam al-Shafi'i said that the person is a fasiq and his testimony is not accepted. He also has another famous saying. He says, I left behind in Baghdad something that the heretics introduced, which they called taghbir, with which they distract people from the Qur'an. So as Shafi'i is saying, people started to come up with something called a taghbir. So what is this taghbir? Basically, it's the type of poetry which encourages ascetic life. Zuhd. Tells you to leave the dunya. And it is sung by someone while he strikes a rod against some kind of drum or dried skin. So this is the comment of a Shafi'i on something like that. Until now, no video, you know, music videos, no poor clothing, no bad words. Calling people to leave from the materialism of the world. And yet he called it something that يعني, the heretics introduced and they distract people from the Qur'an with this. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, he used to say, Al-ghina yumbut al-nifaq fi al-qalb. That it creates, it sprouts hypocrisy in the heart And I do not like it And not one of the four madahib said that music is halal Not one of the four madahib And of the other scholars, Al-Qasim He said that singing is part of falsehood Al-Hasan al-Basri said that If there is music involved in a dinner invitation in a walima Then do not accept the invitation And the other scholars, Imam Al-Qurtubi uh, Imam Abu Tayyib al-Tabari and Ibn al-Salah and Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali and Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Hajr al-Haythami and Makhul and al-Nawawi and many others and Ibn Qadama al-Maqdisi and Ibn Taymiyyah and al-Shaabi and Ibrahim al-Nakhai and Abu Thawr and al-Nu'man all of these people all these great men all these big names saw that it was haram so who will convince you if these people do not convince you and Ibn Hajar al-Hanbali, he said that whoever attributes the opinion permitting music to any of the scholars who are respected in legal issues has surely erred. Anyone who says scholars said, this scholar said it's, it's permissible and that was a respectable scholar, for sure this person is mistaken. Uh, so this young boy, he, he was downloading uh, music for free online and as he was downloading he saw the length of, of each song and how long it was and he thought to himself, that for the, for the length of this entire song Every second of the length of this song Allah is going to be upset with me Every second And so by himself he cancelled all of the downloads The thing that we want to remind and maybe conclude with Is that death can come at any moment Know that the angel of death overlooked you And took the souls of your brothers And one day he's going to come to you And overlook others some people would be sitting and listening to music without any fear that the angel of death will come upon them at that moment. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions a singer, someone who was a music lover back then in his generation. And he was dying, he was in his deathbed. So they told him, say, La ilaha illallah. And he started to repeat songs. They told him, La ilaha illallah. And he kept singing. And when he couldn't say the words to the songs anymore, he began to make sounds and he would say tin tina, tin the, 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 the rhythm with his mouth until the soul left his body. He was not able to say la ilaha illallah. And in our times today, there is a story told by in one of the Muslim countries, people who are like doing motorist assistance in the highways in a Muslim country. He says, I got used to seeing horrible things and injured people along the roads. One day we were making our rounds and we heard a sound, a horrible sound of, of two cars that had collided. So we rushed to the area and we found two cars that were in a head-on collision and were utterly destroyed. We rushed to assist the people and it was indescribable. In the first car there were two young men and they were in a very bad state. He says we took them out as they began to scream from the pain and we rushed to the other car and we found the driver had died. So we returned to those two, and they were in the state of ihtidar, meaning 
the soul now is leaving their bodies. So my partner rushed to them to say, and, and would tell them, say, La ilaha illallah. But they would be moaning in pain. La ilaha illallah. And they're not responding. So then when they started to be in the pangs of death, in the last minutes of death, or they were almost dead, they began to repeat words from songs. And they remained repeating these voices until just singing, just singing constantly, just singing lyrics from songs, constantly. He's telling them, La ilaha illallah, and they're only singing from songs. And then these voices, their voices started to gradually decrease. Then the first one became quiet, and after that the second one became quiet. We put all three in our car, and we took them you know, to, to the morgue. He said, my partner and I on the drive to the morgue, we were not speaking, and we were both quiet. Suddenly my partner turned to me, and he started to talk to me about death, and the good and the bad end on earth, until we got to the hospital, and we put the dead, and we left. From that day onwards, every time I attempted to listen to music, I see the images of the two men as they bid farewell to this dunya with the sound of the shaitan. Six months later, there was another accident. It was a young man who had a flat tire, and he was fixing it, and he got to the back of the car to take the spare out, and a speeding car came, and it smashed into him. So I quickly went with another one of my co-workers, and the young man was on the ground, and he had signs of righteousness on him, but his body was destroyed from the collision. We put him on the, in the car, and on our way I said to myself, I will do as my other friend did, and I will get him to say the shahada. And then he started to make sounds that we couldn't figure out, so we, we were rushing to the hospital. Then his speech began to become clearer. He was reciting the Qur'an in a beautiful voice. We turned to him and he was reciting with khushu' and sukun. And his bones were broken and he was covered with blood on his clothes and he was on his way to his death. We started to speed up even more. He kept reciting in a beautiful voice. I have never heard a voice of the recitation of the Qur'an so beautiful. And he was saying, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ, إن الذين قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهَ ثُمَّ استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون He was saying those who say look at what he is reciting and these are his last words those who say our Lord is Allah and stand straight and steadfast the angels descend upon them from time to time saying fear not and grieve not but receive the glad tidings of paradise that you were promised. We were your protectors in this. We are your protectors in this life and the next. Imagine reciting these ayat and these words, where you will have all that your souls desire, and you will have all that you ask for—a hospitable gift from the one that is most forgiving and most merciful. He says, "My co-worker and I listened to that voice. Then suddenly, I felt a shiver run through my body, and the voice stopped. We turned around and found him." with his finger in the air, and he was saying, La ilaha illallah. We stopped the car, and I jumped, and I ran to the back, and I touched his hand, and I checked his breath, and I checked his heartbeat, there was nothing. And I began to cry. My, pa my partner turned to me, and he said, What happened? I said, The young man has died. Mat al -shab. And, he dis and he died while reciting the Qur'an. So my friend exploded into tears, as for me, I could not control myself and I began to cry uncontrollably and my, cures, and my tears wouldn't stop. We continued on the way to the hospital and when we got there we asked his family about him and they said he was praying constantly at night and reciting the Qur'an. And for that there should be then, there should be an admonition and an indication for those of us who walk around with iPods and constantly listen in their cars and in their and online and in the plains and everywhere else. There should be then an indication and an admonition in that. But a lot of times when we say stories like this, people say, this will not happen to me. I mean, I listen to music, but this won't happen to me. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, this is beyond our control. And I will try to illustrate this to you. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head? A dumb song that perhaps you don't even like. Stuck in your head all day and you are conscious and awake and you can't get it out of your head all day 
This is while you're conscious and awake and you can't control it. So what about when you're in the stupors of death? Stupors meaning like a drunken state. If you're 100% awake and you can't control a song in your head, what makes you think you can control it when you're in the stupors of death? And a song that you love might come out. And so these to- songs, they roll off our tongues easily. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some lyrics, alright? And if you can, complete them. You can complete them out loud, or you can complete them internally, or, you know, whatever you like. We will not accuse you of knowing these songs. Because some of them I had to call friends and got these lyrics from. Some of them I heard from commercials and even in the newscast I would hear them. So if I say, who let the... You know the end. And if I say, oops, I... Don't worry. I love you. You love me. Born to be. You gotta fight for your right to... So embarrassing. You ain't nothing but a Ain't no mountain I believe I can You say I'm a dreamer but We will, we will R-E-S-P-E-C-T Find out How about some difficult ones Under my umbrella I've never heard this but they told me you would know it been, okay, now for the gangsters. Been spending most of their lives living in a... My brothers are like... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> How about this one then? All right, all right, all right, all right. You know the rest of it? It's outcast. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Complete the verses. وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ من بعد ما ما تبين له الهدى ويتبع غير سبيل المؤمنين نوله ما تولى excellent ونصله جهنم وساءت مصيرا طيب وقال الرسول يا رب إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا oh my lord the prophet said oh my lord truly my people have abandoned the Quran وما من غائبة في السماء والأرض إلا في كتاب Mubin. So what makes us say, think we will be able to say La ilaha illallah so easily? When music rolls off our tongue and lyrics rolls off our tongue so easily and the Qur'an has to struggle to come out of our mouth. There is a doctor and he is a, a righteous man inshallah, we don't overpraise him. He said in his career in a Muslim land 36 people died in front of him. 36 people and he would tell them Say La ilaha illallah. And in his entire career, only one person was able to say La ilaha illallah. And he would say that now, I guarantee you can say it a million times if you want to right now. And everyone thinks they'll be able to say it. But out of 36, he only saw one person able to say La ilaha illallah. So test yourself. What rolls off of your tongue easily? When you have a close call or you drop something and it breaks, what is the first thing on your tongue? Do you say Bismillah, Subhanallah? La ilaha illallah, astaghfirullah, or is it a bad word? Oh, sugar, or something else. Or do you start damning things because something happened or something broke? So if in this dunya, while you are 100% awake and conscious, the first thing that rolls out of your tongue is something bad or a bad word. What makes you think you can say la ilaha illallah and it will roll off your tongue easily? And the Prophet wasallam said, Man kana akhir kalamuhu fi dunya la ilaha illallah, dakhal al-jannah. Whoever his last speech is in this dunya is La ilaha illallah, he will enter into paradise. And so now, the whole point is not to make you think you will not be of those people who ask Allah Azza wa that all of us are those who say La ilaha illallah is their final word. But the point is to make us afraid of our bad deeds. There was a man, his name was Zadan al Kindi, and he was a singer, and he sat with a like kind of a, a guitar type instrument with his friends on the road. And he was singing and they were clapping and enjoying. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he came and he passed by them. And so they left. And he grabbed this man, Zadan al-Kindi. He grabbed him and he shook him. And he said, Ya ghulam, ma ahsana hadha sawt, law kana biqra'at al-Qur'an. He said, oh young man, what an excellent voice this would be if only you were reciting the Qur'an. Or in another narration he tells him, لو كان ما يسمع من حسن صوتك يا غلام 
Quran, kunta anta anta. He said, if, if what was heard from your voice was the recitation of the Quran, kunta anta anta, meaning you would have been the one people would turn to, people would look to for leadership. And so, Zadan then, he asked the people, who was that? They told him that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They said, yes. So he ran to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he began to cry to him and he broke his instrument. And Ibn Mas'ud embraced him and he cried and he said, كَيْفَ لَا أُحِبُّ مَنْ أَحَبَّهُ اللَّهِ He said, how can I not love the one whom Allah loves? Why does Allah love him? Because إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِرِينَ Allah loves those who constantly repent and those who purify themselves. So the man repented and that's why Ibn Mas'ud cried and hugged him. And Zadan stayed with him until he became one of the Imams in the Qur'an. Perhaps some people who listened to this were angered by some of my speech because it showed fault in something that they loved. But remember that we're only calling you to something that is more beloved to you. We're calling you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the speech of Allah and to the Qur'an. And no one is offended when he is called to something that is greater. So if you're, going to, you're about to eat a meal and someone invites you to a meal that you love more, you do not become offended. And so that's what we're doing. We're calling people and we're sure that they love Allah more and that they love the Qur'an more. We want people to take the position of Imam Malik when he was a young boy and he wanted to become a singer and his mother moved him towards knowledge and now he's one of the Imams of the Ummah. Today, Islam really and truly needs you to defend it against atheism, to bring people to Allah, to teach the youth and to teach the kids their religion and the proper role models to have and to defend it against ideological attacks and political attacks. Your Prophet ﷺ is being insulted every month and every year. Will you plug up your ears with your iPod as if nothing happens? So take this then, those who listen to music, take it as your first step. And go home and delete your music files and break your CDs and come back to Allah or turn to Him even more. I want to conclude by sharing something very personal with you. When I used to listen to music and I used to attempt to learn to play uh, guitar, and then I heard that music was haram, but I didn't want to believe it. But I knew that was the truth. Because every time I listened to music, the feeling wasn't the one I was getting now at the classes and the masajid and reciting the Qur'an. So I became more and more convinced that it was haram without reading a single book or article on the topic. And I thought, there is no way I can stop listening to music. But what happened was that once I was very busy for two or three days, and I didn't have any time to listen to music, after the two or three days were over, I realized that I didn't even have the longing for it, and you don't really need to listen to it. There is no addiction, there is no patch or gum involved in quitting music. I just stopped listening to it, and and there was no shaking or anything of that sort. So, it's not that difficult to stop yourself. And one of my family members, I have two brothers and two sisters, and I'm not, they don't want me to disclose which one. But one of my family members was still continuing to listen to music. And so he or she said that one day, they saw a ru'ya, a, a, a dream, in which the Prophet ﷺ visited us in our house. And the person, this family member said, I was very excited when I came to know that the Prophet ﷺ is in the rooms in one of our house. And he was talking to you, meaning me, and my mother, we were with the Prophet ﷺ and talking to him. And I'm, you know, we're from Sudan, so in Sudan when a guest comes, you, you bring a tray, and you put, pour some Pepsi and you bring it to the guest. So she said, I went to get Pepsi for the Prophet ﷺ. <laughs> and when I he went to take, so now I'll throw you off, when he went to take the, uh, the drink, the person stopped by the bathroom. And in the bathroom, he felt that there was something there, the person felt that there was something in the bathroom. He found a, a baby boy sitting in the bathtub. And he was very cute. And he was singing a song uh, in Arabic, أَبْعِدْ مِنِّي الْوَلَدَّةِ الْوَلَدَّةِ Take this little boy away from me. This little boy is going to drive me crazy. The person says, I looked at him and I, then I remembered that I have to take the Pepsi. But I was delayed in the, looking at this boy. And I, when I got to the room, the Prophet ﷺ was gone. But there was a very strong, beautiful odor in the room. 
person says, I woke up very happy. And days later, I kept thinking about it. And I started to think about the lyrics of the song. And I realized that the child was adorable. And it was alluring. And it was singing. And it made me miss the visit of the Prophet ﷺ. So it diverted me from the Prophet ﷺ. I was diverted from the Prophet ﷺ because of singing. To the point that I didn't even see him. And didn't show him the hospitality of offering the drink to the guest. And all was left was the scent of the Prophet ﷺ. I will conclude with the verse from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum wa yuridu alladheena yattabi'oona shahawat an tamilu maylan azimah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished for you to turn. We wished for you to turn to Him. And He wished that He would forgive you. But those who follow their lusts and desires want you to turn away from Allah a great deal. With that, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal, and He is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, to reward those who put this event together and who will help distribute this lecture. And I would like to thank you also for being uh, you know, patient. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the sincere repentance of all the believers who hear this talk and decide to leave the haram. Ya Allah, we ask you to give them strength and bring them closer to you and make them from those whom you love. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us a good end on this earth and that He makes the last thing we say in this dunya, La ilaha illallah, and to make the best day the day when we meet Him while He is pleased with us and He enters us in, into Jannah while He is pleased with us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth as clear truth and make us follow it and show us the falsehood as clear falsehood and help us abstain from it. I would like to thank you for being an attentive audience and I apologize for, uh, for going so much over. Thank you for being patient. And I ask Allah to make us of those who hear this speech and follow the best of it and the best of what was said. My apologies if I used any phrases that were hurtful or inappropriate. Wa sallallahu wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi sahbihi ajma'een. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين ما بعد. We now want to look at the arguments of those who say that music is halal. And bear in mind that we mentioned how the Sahaba didn't differ on this issue, and that there was consensus amongst the Sahaba and earlier the earliest generations of scholars from the Tabi'een that it is haram, that it's not permissible. But there are scholars who argue that it's halal and mostly contemporary scholars that argue that it's halal and they base this ruling on mistakes of early scholars as we're going to look at inshallah. And the fact that a mistaken minority saw that it was halal it doesn't make it a legitimate opinion, you see? So if you have three or four people they have an opinion that it's halal that doesn't mean this is a legitimate opinion. Because for any opinion to be valid or legitimate, it has to be backed up by some evidence, right? So you can't have just someone jump and just say some random words, unless there's you know, some evidence that backs it up, then you can say, okay, this is a legitimate argument. So I'm going to give you some examples of opinions, of some real examples of opinions of scholars on different issues. And these are all, uh, Ill, no, they're not really legitimate, they don't have uh, no good uh, any evidence, clear evidence. There are some scholars that say, it's not permissible for you to see your mother's hair. So she has to be wearing hijab in front of you. Others have said, dog meat is halal. Others have said, stealing from the kuffar uh, is halal. Please nobody make takbir, okay? <laughs> there are some scholars said that, you know, Isha prayer in, in the summer, in the most northern European cities, uh, countries like you know in, in England and maybe Finland and so on in summer they shouldn't pray Isha they have this opinion they based it on the fact that they, they can't see any of, this, any of the signs that it's time for Isha and therefore they said it should be dropped during the summer but in the winter you can pray Isha so these are all opinions but they're invalid opinions because they don't have the, the proof or the backing so uh, the fact that someone has an opinion doesn't make it valid unless they have strong support or strong proof. So let's look at some of the, uh, the arguments presented by those who say that music is halal. And they tried to produce some logical arguments. They said that, uh, they tried to mention some of the good things that come out of music. They say it's a useful tool 
and an instrument of change. I mean, and you can feel free to disagree with me. I personally don't believe that this is generally true. And I'll explain what I mean by generally true. Because you might have some famous singer who will sing a song about and bring awareness to some rare disease, let's say Kleinfelter's syndrome. Okay? And because he's popular and the word reaches so many people, he may bring uh, some benefit by bringing awareness to this rare disease. But uh, generally, the positive messages fall upon deaf ears and the bad messages are obeyed. And generally, you, we cannot attribute generally that uh, good messages come or good comes out of music. I mean, you might remember, some of you are young, but you might remember in the 90s, Mr. MC Hammer came, <laughs> came out with a song and he kept saying, we need to pray, right? We need to pray just to make it today. You might say, takbir, right? But... Uh, did that song, and the song was very popular, it was a hit, a number one, and just about everybody heard it. But did that co song cause more people to start going to masajid and churches around the country, and more people to pray? I mean, <laughs> there are no statistics, but I, ser I seriously doubt that. So even when there is a good message, it falls upon deaf ears. But generally the messages that are followed, degrading women, you know, and, and it's increasing in society, zina, and things of that sort. So if it is a weapon for messages, it's a counterproductive weapon. And not, not much good comes out of it. And so someone might argue, well, uh, you know, some good comes out of it. Like for example, when the, the singers got together and they sang, We Are the World, and then they gave money to the people who are starving in Africa. So here, the, you know, the song generated something that assisted. It generated money. And, you know, the song itself didn't help. What I mean? Like, so if... Uh, you know, if those people, those singers go and start singing We Are the World to these starving people, the singing itself won't help them. It was the money generated from the song. And so we, c we can extend that argument to anything else. We could sell alcohol, then the money could save, you know, and, and, and eliminate poverty. Or we could sell drugs, and then the money is what will help. So it's still, even though they use money, the way and the medium they use to get the money is, is not something that's good. Um... And, uh, okay, so, so then the other argument they give you, so the first thing they try to tell you, good things come out of it, you know. And the other argument they try to tell you, sa'atan fasa'a. Always, you say, you know, turn that off, turn on Quran, they tell you one hour, one hour. So what does that mean? It's based on the hadith where Hamdala, radiallahu anhu, complained to the Prophet Sallam that the iman decreases slightly when they go home and they sit with children, they talk about the dunya, things of that sort. So the Prophet Sallam tells him, sa'a, you know, an hour for like that for the heart, and then an hour like that. So the but Hamdallah anhu the the other hour was not engaging in haram. So you can't say you know I do haram, but you know sa'a of haram, and then one hour of doing good for the sake of Allah. So you can't use it a hadith where just a, you know something innocent is being done, iman decreases during that to say well that means you can do haram just one hour here and one hour there. And it just wouldn't make sense to anyone that, you know, one hour of Qur'an, one hour of, of Madonna. And that was not the comparison anyways. Um, so let me, uh, then another argument is that they tell you, these are the people who support music and they say it's halal. They tell you, and I want you to listen to this carefully, that uh, people have a natural inclination to music and to liking music. It is something that's natural. And when you see a child, you know, if a child hears music, they might start to dance without anyone specifically teaching that child dance moves. A two-year-old just started to walk, he'll start to bounce up and down when he hears musical notes. So they tell you that this is proof that it's halal because it's something that's natural and it's good and therefore it's permissible. You see the argument? And so, uh, first of all, let me explain why people involuntarily start to move to music. Why they start to bounce or, you know, whatever, when they listen to music. The answer is that uh, the part of the brain that appreciates music is the same part of the brain that is in charge of motor movements. And so there's that link for people to jump up and down and act crazy. Now, as for the argument that it's natural, there are many things that are natural and they're also not permitted. Who can give me an example? Something that's natural, but it's very limited or not permitted. Yes, sir? Naam? I can't hear you, Allah. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> babe, I wanted something more, like, more uh, basic, but the brother said glancing at the opposite gender comes naturally, you know? <laughs> Sorry about that. 
<laughs> All right. طيب. How about sexual desire? يعني if you're saying, well, it's natural to like music, therefore it must be haram. Well, it's natural to have sexual desire. Does that mean it's halal then? But it's restricted here. All avenues are closed except in the halal way. How about, and I know I'm, يعني, uh, my examples are always like strange or disgusting, but uh, relieving yourself, that's natural. And one time this atheist kept arguing with me that this sexual desire is natural. So the أخي, it's natural to relieve yourself. Get up on the table, pull your pants down and go ahead. <laughs> and it was extreme because he was being harsh. So then he stopped. I said, not everything that's natural is, is flouted and touted in public. But <laughs> and there are other things that are natural that have restrictions on them. Eating and drinking, they're natural. But there are some things that are restricted. So like, you know, you can't you know, eat pork, you can't drink wine and things of that sort. So to argue that it's something that's natural is not a valid argument. To say, well, one hour like this, one hour like that, you know, the comparison is incorrect. To say that all well, the good comes out of it is incorrect. And a lot of people always tell you then that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَمِيلٌ يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ Oh, you always hear this. That Allah is beautiful, He only loves things that are beautiful. And so, I remember I overheard one th- when I first came to the U.S., someone in the masjid, and he was saying... Uh, someone asked him, is music halal? And, the, and the, you know, the, the uncle just said, you know, Allah, those things that are beautiful. So if it's good music, then it's good, you know. And if it's bad, then it's haram. So, uh, the, yeah, and they always tell you, in kana muthiran lishahawat, then it's haram. If it, if it you know, arouses your, like, your lust or your desires, that means it's haram. So, and some contemporary scholars, when they're asked about music, is it halal or haram? They say it's like poetry. The good of poetry is good and it's bad is bad. Or only if it fires up your desires, then it's bad. So Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah has a very powerful argument and logical response to that. He said that there is nothing in Islam where it is halal when you enter it and then you can discover towards the end that it's actually haram. What does that mean? So I'm listening to a song. Let's say it's a, it's a country music song. The guy's talking about how his car broke down and all these things. And the words seem very innocent. This man is having a rough day. And so I think, okay, well, this is a halal song. He's not saying anything bad. So it's halal. So I'm enjoying it, tapping my toes. And then suddenly, towards the end, he starts to have a good day. He meets a woman, he fornicates, or he smokes a joint in the end of the song. So that means now suddenly I'm like, oh, he smoked a joint, astaghfirullah. Suddenly the song became haram for me. But it was haram since the beginning, but I didn't know. So I was allowed to go into something that was haram, and I only discovered it at the end. Is there anything like this in Islam? Is there any type of meal that you can think of where it's halal for you to eat it, and at the end you might discover that it's haram and just leave it? So, it, you know why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-halal bayin wal haram bayin. The halal is clear, and the haram is clear. There's nothing where you delve into something and then a year later you're like, oh, that was haram? Oh, no such thing. Allah makes it clear so you don't fall into it and then you discover that it's haram. طيب. So, um, and sometimes people will tell you, you know, we just, you know, this, this song has beautiful words. Allah, I remember I was invited to someone's house for lunch and, you know, they're in control, it's their remote control. So, you know, all of them suddenly start to act. Like something incredible is, is coming on. It was some old geezer, some Arab singer, and he was going to sing this Arab song. And they just kept giving me the intro, you know, because they see, you know, my beard is above one inch, so they're, they're okay, this guy, maybe he doesn't appreciate this stuff. So they kept trying to tell me, this is good guy. You know, this guy, his words are beautiful. His words are beautiful. And the guy was so ridiculous. All he started saying, he kept just repeating, in my heart is an old scar. In my heart. Yeah, salam. This is beautiful. I can write something better than that if you like. So, they just kept saying the words are beautiful. And I just looked at them. If you are really people who are infatuated with beautiful words, what is the Quran doing on your shelf? And if you're someone who's totally in love with beautiful words, you would really love the Quran. You wouldn't be saying, oh, this guy has an old scar. Yeah, inshallah, you have an old scar on your face. I don't care. And what is this? Tayyip. Others then, they say, as long as it's not too much, and it doesn't get out of hand. How on earth do I gauge that? You know, it, Do you have any kind of uh, time frame or formula that I can use to gauge myself when music starts to get out of hand? And how will I know when it gets out of hand? <laughs> yeah, and during the day, I listen to 10 hours of music. When I get to the 11th hour, I start to shivering or something happens to me. 
So give me something realistic here. Or it's halal for me in the early part of the day, but then in the end it's haram. So at night your friends turn on some music. No, no, it's haram. I've already listened to eight hours. Please. It just... It doesn't make any sense. طيب. Uh, and I remember one of the first articles I read you know, many years ago about music described how an imam in the masjid, in the Jum'ah khutbah, he got up and he began to mention this famous, uh, I don't want to give away the country, but she was, her name was Umm Kulthum. Okay, that was a joke, so you know where she's from. And the, he started to talk about these people being you know, crazed with her songs, the people in the masjid, in the Jum'ah khutbah, who are not supposed to open their mouth, or speak, or even tell each other to be quiet, they rushed up climbing the member to beat up the imam. And I remember as a young man reading this and saying, it can't be, yani, this can't be something halal, that will incite someone so much that he wants to beat one of the scholars of Islam in the house of Allah, because he attacked someone who sings about you know, singing and, and, and love and all this stuff. It can't be then. So, and the other thing is that, you know, going overboard, because the argument is that as long as it's not too much, it doesn't get out of hand. Getting out of hand with music is not related to the direct number of hours that you listen to it. Yeah, I mean, just like those people, you know, they, they wanted to beat up the imam, it was the day of Jum'ah. It's most likely that they didn't wake up and listen to any music on the day of Jum'ah. But the effect stayed with them. So to give it a number of hours per day, the effect will, will leave you the next day. It's not true. Alright, so then other people thought they were clever and they said that you know as long as the sounds you imitate are halal sounds so he said you know you know a bird makes some sound and I repeat the same sound with the flute so mashallah it's halal now and uh, and so therefore they will you know imitate bird songs thumping they will slam books and you know slap their chest and beat their chest things like that to make these sounds and but I can go even further than that I can suggest that we can take any human speech and just to make things worse, let's take an Islamic speech. And then we're going to go in with, with the computer and we're going to isolate different pitches and different tones from this man's voice. The high pitches, the low pitch, uh, pitches. And then we're going to arrange them in a musical scale. And then you can take them and arrange them in any way to make any song that you want to. From someone's voice. You can now do that with today's technology. So does that make it halal? It doesn't make it halal. So the scholars say imitating the sounds of instruments is not permissible either. So say, okay, well we don't have any musical instruments, but alhamdulillah we have brother Hassan, he's a big guy, he sounds just like a tuba, and we have a uh, brother, he's so soft, he sounds like the piano, and then the, everybody starts making sounds and then I sing over it, and that is halal. We're imitating the sounds of, of, of instruments and their sounds are forbidden. Uh, perhaps you may know this song called Don't Worry Be Happy. Those of you who are familiar with that song will probably know that there's not a single musical instrument in that song. How many people did not know that? Okay, so some people didn't notice that. Because it sounds like a musical instrument, but it was all done with the people's mouth. طيب. Uh, and then of course generally that any wind, or, or meaning an instrument that you blow into, any string and any percussion instrument is haram. And any combination of that, like the piano, you strike, but then there's a string that is struck, uh, or anything that imitates or replaces those sounds. Even if it was initially a, ha a halal sound, you mixed it up and it became a haram sound. Some people then, when you ask them is music halal, they compare it to instances in which the Sahaba sang. And wallahi, this is an unbelievably unfair. So you ask someone, is music halal? A young man asks the Shaykh, is music halal? What is he thinking? He's thinking MTV, VH1, what have you. And the Shaykh says, well, Allah, the Sahaba sang. When they were building the ditch, digging the ditch in Al Khandaq, they were singing as they were working. And they sang, Tala al Badru alayna when the Prophet ﷺ came from Tabuk. Tabuk. So this is really dishonest and it's unfair. And Shaykh, Shaykh Ibn, Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, he said, Inna al Mufti wal Alim kat tabib. That the Mufti and the scholar is like a doctor. قبل أن يكتب الدواء يسأل عن المريض ويسأل عن موطن المريض. So he says that before he writes the, the like the prescription or the medicine or the remedy, he asks about the sick person. He asks about him and he asks about which country he comes from and he bases that the concoction he makes is based on that. So he's saying the mufti is the same way. 
So when someone comes and asks about, you know, what is prevalent today, like in music in, you know, MTV, and then you tell them, well, the companions sang when they were building, the, digging the ditch. It's not a fair com- a comparison, and it's very dishonest. And he, you can't compare that, you know, with MTV, with the, with the clothing, with the words, with the instruments, with the women, and then you compare it to men who didn't use any instruments and they were not saying any words that were calling it something that was haram. It's not a fair comparison. And of course, some of them, and we don't want to waste too much time with this group, they said singing is a form of worship. And, you know, and we obey Allah through this and so on. So Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he tells them how strange. What type of faith, you know, what type of religion, what, what type of light, what type of insight and guidance and knowledge can be gained from listening to tuneful voice verses and music in which most of the said is haram. And he continues saying, how can anyone who has the least amount of insight and faith in his heart draw near to Allah and increase his faith by enjoying something which is hated by him, meaning hated by Allah. This doesn't make any sense. So we won't waste time with that. So now we go to, now these people, they have the hadith also. The people who say music is halal. So they have this hadith and they say this is proof that music is halal. So look at the hadith and see how it, if, if it supports their argument or not. Aisha radiallahu anha uh, says Abu Bakr that entered upon her on the day of Eid. And you all know this hadith. And she had two young girls with her who were singing the verses that the Ansar had said on the day of Bu'ath, which is like a, like a battle in war. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu entered and he said, A mizmaru shaytan fi bayti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are the musical instruments or like the pipe of the shaytan in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet ﷺ, he had turned away from them. Now he turned around and he said, Leave them alone, O Abu Bakr, for every nation has its Eid, and this is our Eid, the people of Islam. Okay. So, can you see now how they are saying this hadith says music is halal? They tell you, well, aha, uh-huh. it's allowed, the Prophet ﷺ allowed them, so that's proof that it's something that's halal. Okay, then the problem is that this hadith, for them, the problem is that this hadith is actually proof that it's haram. It's not any proof that it's halal. Look at the points. First of all, let's look at the age of the girls. Because the, the ajariya in Arabic has two meanings. It's either a young girl who has not reached the age of puberty, or it's a servant girl. She can be an older girl, but she's still a jariya, she's a servant girl. So which one is, is the correct one here? Is, he a just, is it a just their servant's girls, any age? Or are they young girls who haven't reached the age of puberty? And the answer are the young girls who haven't reached the age of puberty because... Aisha says there were girls from the Ansar, so the, the helpers, so they couldn't have been s- uh, slave girls or servant girls. Obviously they're from the Ansar, so that means they were young girls. So they're young girls, and now we look at the words, the words that they're using. They were from the days of Bu'ath, so they were talking about war and heroics of war. Nothing corrupting, nothing about your eyes and your hair and all that stuff. And then there, was no, there were no percussion or string instruments. So to compare it with MTV and the today's music, it, it's a crime. And it was halal for them. Aisha radiallahu anha was, was young at the time. It was halal for these young girls to do that. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam turned away from them. So someone might, meaning he wasn't paying attention to them also. So someone might ask then, well why was he then in the same room? Who can answer that? Why was he in the same room? Muhammad. Okay, close, but there's another reason. Why was he in the same room? Zakallah khair. It was only one room. The, ha- the room of Aisha radiallahu anhu was six feet by six feet with walls of mud, mud and palm stalks and a, a ceiling that sometimes would leak in. It, was, it had leaf, palm leaves and, you know, uh, like a leather hide over it to prevent the rain from coming in. One room is the house, you know. And now we live in these palaces and like, I want to be alone. And there's two people in the room. Big living room. I need some me time. Wallahi. Anyways, so, so uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, another thing was that she was young and it was never transmitted from her any hadith or anything after she reached the age of puberty except condemnation of singing. Everything we heard from Aisha radiallahu anha after that, after she matured, was condem- condemnation of singing. We look at, uh, this is her son's brother, uh, her brother's son, Afwan. Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad and she taught him he, he gained his knowledge from her and he used to condemn singing and said that it's not allowed to listen to it 
So this is the student of Aisha radiallahu anha. This is proof then that she only did that and was permissible for her. They were young and then after that she never said anything uh, except condemning music. Uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when he comes in, very important, he calls it the flute of the shaitan, the instrument of the shaitan. So the first question is, where do you think he got this name from? Did he make it up? That's the first thing. And was it the, the, like the, like the norm for Abu Bakr to suggest something like that, to make up something like that in front of the Prophet ﷺ? So that's the first thing. The second thing, so, where, so, so most likely he was aware of this. And uh, he wouldn't tell off Meaning, in like you know, reprimand. He wouldn't reprimand anyone in front of the Prophet ﷺ unless he knew that that was wrong. So if if he enters something a halal is happening in front of the Prophet ﷺ, he's not going to reprimand that person. The the fact that he came in and he said that he knew this was something that was wrong and it was happening in front of the Prophet ﷺ and he said it. But the exception was made for the day of Eid. So again, what kind of a comparison you're saying? This is a hadith talking about the day of Eid. And now you're listening to it every single day of the year. So the, even the comparison is incorrect. This was an exception. The Prophet ﷺ said, Leave them Abu Bakr for today is the day of our Eid. That was the exception. And also, uh, the hadith also shows that it was not the habit of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions to gather and to listen to singing. Proof was how Abu Bakr reacted. I mean, if they were listening to music all the time, you think Abu Bakr would react like that? He wouldn't. So Ibn Qayyim comments on this saying I'm amazed, um, amazed that you quote as evidence For allowing listening to sophisticated songs Imagine Ibn, Ibn Qayyim Saying sophisticated to- songs at his time So what if he hears our songs now He, uh, he said The report which we have m- uh, mentioned About how two young girls were below the age of puberty Sang to a young woman on the day of Eid Some verses of Arab poetry About bravery in war and other noble characteristics How can you compare this to that? So, this hadith then is far for being evidence that it is halal. So then, uh, some other evidences that they use. Listen to this and tell me if this sounds like an evidence that music is halal. It was narrated that Nafi, uh, the, the freed servant of Abdullah ibn Umar, Umar radiallahu anhuma, he said Ibn Umar heard a woodwind instrument or some kind of flute or instrument that you blow into and he put his fingers in his ears and he kept away from that path. So he said to me, because they were walking together, so he heard someone over there playing the flute, he plugged his ears. He said to me, Ya Nafa, can you hear anything? This is after a while. So I said, no. So then he took his fingers away from his ears and said, I was with the Prophet wasallam, and he heard something like this, like a shepherd or someone playing a flute, and he did the same thing. The Prophet did the same thing, and then he asked Ibn Umar, can you hear it anymore? Ibn Umar said, no. So he unplugged his ears. So, and this is uh, the Sahih Hadith in the book of Abu Dawood, rahimahullah. So the argument they say is that he didn't instruct Ibn Umar to put his fingers in his ears. The Prophet ﷺ plugged his ears, but he didn't say plug your ears, Ibn Umar. Abdullah, he didn't say plug your ears. So that means that, uh, and if it was haram and so on, it would have been, he would have told Ibn Umar to plug his ears, and Ibn Umar would have told Nafi' to plug his ears. So if anyone besides Muhammad, can you tell us any... Why this hadith is not a uh, proof that music is halal? Why is it not proof that it's halal? Because, um, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he, he mentions how there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing and listening. What was, you know, like when you go to a store, you want to buy you know, something, and you can hear music. You know, but oh, you're just there to, to purchase whatever you want and then you're going to leave. You're not sitting there enjoying it and, and reminiscing and oh Allah, this is so sweet. You're just listening, you just hear it. Okay? So that means this the mechanical action of these sound waves hitting into your ears, but it's not registering with you. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want to do the least case, which is just to hear the haram. The least case he didn't want to do. That's why he plugged his ears. But Ibn Umar, he was hearing, he could just hear it. But he wasn't listening to it. Everyone understand the difference? And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he compares like the, to someone who is, uh, the Qur'an is being played, but he is not, he, his intention is not to listen to the Qur'an, and he is not listening to it. He just hears it. Does he get reward for just hearing it? No. 
But if he's listening to it, he gets reward. And he says the opposite with music. If you're listening to it, then it's blameworthy or if you get a sin. But if you just hear it, that's it's different. Um, and that's why uh, when, you, when you enter a restaurant, uh, just as a general advice to the brothers, I've always seen that brothers, when they go into a restaurant, I'll tell you generally restaurant owners, they hate bearded brothers. You know why? Because we're unbelievably rude when we tell them to lower the music. We just come, brothers, we go, brothers. Lower that music What's wrong with you? Why don't you just tell them Look, we're having a meeting Or we're discussing some issues And we can't hear ourselves think Because could you lower it a little she Brothers make an issue And uh, there's some restaurants that we go The minute they see us coming in With our beards and stuff like, they, they hate us Because they know they see this bad behavior from us Please be aware of that Do not misbehave like that with people And ask them in a nice way You don't have to frown you know, This is haram I'm, I'm, you know, This is munkar And we're stopping it And we're chopping the head off Relax Relax a little bit طيب. So now the hadith we mentioned in Bukhari Which is a sahih hadith And I'll start to wrap up inshallah I mean or to go faster uh, The Prophet Sallallahu said There will be in my ummah people who make halal Or allow fornication Adultery And silk and wine and musical instruments They make them halal It means they're haram The first attempt by people who say music is halal They started to attack this hadith And accuse it of being weak because and this is based on a mistake that Ibn Hazm made, and Ibn Hazm he was uh, rahimahullah is a great scholar, but he was not his his um, and his um, his field of expertise was not hadith, and he, it was said by him or about him by other scholars that he often erred, made mistakes in his critical assessment of the degrees of a narration and the conditions of the narrators. So Ibn Hazm misunderstood the way it was narrated, and he thought that there was a break in the chain, but. All the scholars and the, yani, of hadith They mentioned that uh, it is sahih And it has been The same hadith has been narrated Through nine different uh, places From nine different places And nine different times And so basically it is not weak And it has been He has been refuted extensively In many books And most famously by the scholar Ibn Salah So the argument that this hadith is weak Is not It's a weak argument Okay so then they st- still try to hang on to this hadith and find some way out. They said that this hadith, the things in this hadith, the four, which were the fornication, the silk, and the wine, and the music. They said these things are haram because they're combined together. You see? And it's, so music is not haram unless it's accompanied with alcohol, and uh, zina, and silk. So I wonder, what if it music is involved with alcohol and zina and polyester? What happens then? <laughs> so, and they're claiming they're only haram, music is only haram when you combine it with these three. And the scholars, like Shawkani, rahimahullah, he says that that would mean zina is not haram unless it's accompanied by the other three as well. And what does it mean, yastahillun? These things are haram, you see? And then he mentions <laughs> on the same kind of scale... An argument saying in the Quran uh, Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنَّهُ كَانَ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ الْعَظِيمِ وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ Allah says He used to not believe in Allah the most great And he urged not the feeding of the poor So then uh, Shawkani uh, says this, this would mean That it's not haram to disbelieve in Allah As long as you're not encouraging <laughs> someone to not feed the poor You see So it doesn't make any sense The argument doesn't hold any water Five. One more hadith They said This is proof That music is halal This hadith goes like this uh, Amr ibn Shu'ayb He says He heard from his grandfather That a woman said O Prophet of Allah I have vowed to strike upon the duf And everyone know what a duf is it Kind of looks like a tambourine But it doesn't have the, the rattles And basically it's like an animal skin That's stretched over this thing That's, that's the duf she said, I vowed to strike the duf in your presence. And the Prophet ﷺ responded to her, fulfill your vow. Okay. So now, this hadith, you can understand it when you look at it uh, in another narration that explains it in more detail. This is the narration of a tirmidhi He says, Buraida said, Allah's messenger left for one of his expeditions. And upon his return, a black servant girl came to him saying, O messenger of Allah, I vowed that if Allah returned you safely, I would beat the duf and sing in your presence. 
so the Prophet ﷺ tells her, In kunti nadarti fadribi wa illa fala. That if you have made the vow, then beat the duf. And if not, then don't. What does it mean if not? Meaning if you didn't vow, then don't do it. So this, you know, they're saying this is proof that it's permissible. So now let's, but you see, you have to go into it in detail. The first thing, uh, well, the rest of the story is she began to beat the duf. And then Abu Bakr entered and she kept beating. Then Ali entered, she kept beating. Uthman entered, she kept beating. When Umar entered, she immediately threw it underneath her and she sat on it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ لَا يَخَافُ مِنْكَ يَا عُمَرِ Rather, the shaitan is afraid of you, O Umar. So isn't it interesting how the shaitan is brought up suddenly and shaitan is mentioned. So you see, first of all, because usually the duf is on occasions like Eid, weddings. So why is she beating the duf on this occasion? The Prophet ﷺ is returning safely. The scholars say, the safe return of the Prophet ﷺ is greater than any Eid. Who would disagree with that? And if a Prophet of Allah is killed, that's the biggest calamity possible. So if the Prophet ﷺ comes safely, returns safely from a, a battle, it's greater than the day of Eid. So that's why she wanted to beat the duf on that day. The second thing we could see, she was a servant girl, because she was dr- described as a black servant girl. And the servants were generally less restricted in dress and in their manners or mannerisms. Uh, because of like the nature of their type of work, so the servant girl, when you study fiqh, you know, she doesn't have to cover as much as the, you know, uh, the, the free woman, as they say. The other thing is that she vowed, and, and everyone knows what a vow is, right? And you say to Allah, if this happens, I will, I will you know, it's like a promise to Allah, if this happens, I'm going to do this. She vowed for, to do something halal for her. You see? It's halal for her, this vow. Yet, look what the Prophet ﷺ said to her, in kunti nadarti fadribi wa illa fala. That if, you know, if you didn't vow, don't do it. Why? It shows that it's still preferable for you to, to not do it. It's still preferable that you don't do it If you didn't vow But since you vowed, you promised Allah Okay And then she stopped when Umar came And the Prophet And he said the shaitan is afraid of Umar So If there wasn't a link between And it's generally these types of malahi and shaitan The Prophet wouldn't have said that Okay um, um, Otherwise I was going to read to you The hadith that are authentic Because we only mentioned you know a few but there are actually many hadith that are authentic and there is no weakness in them. Uh, talking about music in the books of Bukhari and books of Ibn Majah and Ibn Hanbal and others. But we're running out of time so I'll skip that. Perhaps maybe we, I can put up these notes on uh, a website. Maybe Sheikh Mu'ad can announce a website. I'll put the notes up so you can use them. Um, but very quickly, the permissible times are in times of jihad. Right? Times of jihad, Eid, and weddings, the arrival of like an important personality, like when the Prophet ﷺ, they sang Tala al Badru alayna when he came back from Tabuk. During travel, as we mentioned, the, the hadith of Anjisha when he was singing travel. You know, when you're lonely, they say also you can sing to yourself. So suddenly there's a beam of light on you, you start singing, and then everybody starts dancing around you. Like, yeah? uh, or when you have a baby or a child, you're trying to put them to sleep, you can sing. For the child, but then the, the scholars say that you know also if it's to increase spiritual consciousness, engage you know in pious activities, salah and charity and so on. But they say do it in moderation. It shouldn't and, and, and in proper decorum as well. It doesn't take over the life of the Muslims now. And so and so is singing, and so and so is coming. It, it shouldn't ever take over their life like that. And but all this that we're talking about, all these occasions that is permissible, this has no musical instruments, no sweet boys who are acting all sweet and, and you know nice and make the girls go crazy and all these things while they're singing about taqwa and lowering the gaze, yani, as we see now it's going overboard. So um, and then type so it has to be no forbidden instruments and, and it has to not to, you know over take the Muslim and the focus of uh, and their minds focus and it should not be recited by women. Uh, or, or it should also not include haram or obscene speech They shouldn't resemble the tunes of, of the people of immorality or promiscuity Meaning that you can't get a, a funky beat from one of the rappers right? And then put, uh, you know, oh, I gotta pray and then talk about all these violent prayer things you, you want to do You already took, uh, it, it resembles now the music of the, the, uh, those vile people So it wouldn't be uh, permissible And you can't use vocal effects that sound like musical instruments and you can't get this high from it 
and uh, طيب I think we're done سبحانك اللهم ربنا وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك صلى الله وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين and now questions and answers uh, سلام وعليكم السلام are nasheeds halal uh, and are nasheeds with instruments halal uh, the, with instruments I, I have not read نعم I've not seen or read any scholar that said they're halal. The instruments themselves are, are haram. And I've not seen any clear proof or even a weak proof that for men to use the duf is permissible. Uh, on the contrary, Shaykh Hassan ibn Taymiyyah says for men to use the duf and sing, it is, means they resemble women. And that's why we said the women were called mukhannathin, that they're effeminate men. Because this didn't exist for men to beat the duf. So I, I've not seen any... Uh, any kind of evidence that men can beat on any instrument. So the nashids are halal, yes, if they're sung by men about good things, they don't, uh, you know, take over your life, and they're not uh, accompanied with any musical instrument. A group of brothers are planning to start a nashid group. What are your advice? What's your advice to them? Uh, don't get fresh and then get all sweet and overdo that sweet stuff. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> just sing it. No instruments, anything like that. That's the answer. Allah knows best. Uh, this is if I'm in a music band and I'm really attached to it, the people, the feeling, and so on. How can I free myself from this rock band so that now I can become a better Muslim and get closer to Allah? One one immediate advice I can give you is you need to, you know, remove yourself very far away from these people. Not even to hang around for anything not related to music. Stay away. And, and I know and a lot of brothers who are lead singers in bands and so forth. They absolutely stayed away and just never saw those people. And there's a lot of evidence to that, that you, you, the first thing you need to do is change your environment. As we know from the hadith of the man who killed 100, the first piece of advice given to him was to move to the new city. This is just in short, and Allah knows best. Uh, I know this name would come up. <laughs> Some of the so-called munshideen, such as blank blank, or blank, who sing the topics of Islam, however they... Uh, com- uh, are complying with rules of nasheed are they complying with rules of nasheed are they using Islam as a facade and is it really they are forerunners in the Muslim in reality they are forerunners in the Muslim world I mean well we live in a time if a musician says a word it reaches more ears than the greatest scholar in the ummah this is the, the sad thing so um, but uh, they, what they are doing if they are using instruments again it, it, it's not right if they are using instruments then they just, like we said, sounding like these people and uh, the difference is just, you know, in the end I prayed and in the end he smoked the joint. That's the only difference. And Allah knows best. Is the duf permissible for women only? Can men listen to nasheed that has duf sound in it? Uh, the, the duf is permissible for women only, as I, as I just mentioned. So I think we just answered that. Um, and I, like I said, I haven't seen any evidence that the men can use it. Sometimes we hear that the uh, duf is an allowed instrument. How valid is this opinion? For women it is. Is it also permissible, impermissible to listen to nasheeds with instruments? Yes, it is impermissible to listen to them. Can we listen to music that reminds us of Allah and, and His creation? Example, that guy again. <laughs> uh, or poetry that has messages, uh, Islamic messages. Poetry, uh, this is absolutely, no, no, no scholars have said that poetry is Islamic messages ever, have said they're haram. Is permissible. The minute you start to use, recite that poetry and beat some other instrument, then it becomes impermissible. Even if the guy claims to be re- re- reminding you to come back to Allah while he's playing his electric guitar. No. Oh uh, Yeah, I mean, a lot of time, especially young people, they go overboard. When a scholar says, uh, you know, music is halal, they attack him and they discredit his deen and his akhlaq and his knowledge. No, don't do that, okay? We can mention some of our great and beloved scholars who have passed away and, and who are alive today who had made mistakes in their rulings and in their fatawa. We never discredited every other good thing they did because of one mistake. So if, you know, Sheikh Al-Qardawi, for example, he says, you know, music is halal or anything like that, you don't attack the Sheikh like that. So يعني, be aware of that. Should we take the course music in college if it's required? Um, I'm sure people have dealt with this issue before. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not able to answer this because I don't know how stringent and how insistent upon you, you know you attending this course the college would be. There's nothing else that you can take. I mean, if they insist on you taking music, take something else like dance. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but uh, 
as I understand, I mean, I don't know. You have to, the specifics of your school would determine the answer. I mean, if they break your neck to take the class and bring them a fatwa from your masjid, or then again, your fatwa might say it, it's good as long as the words are good, right? So this one is saying, what about questions that call to nationalism? I mean, and if we said, if using an instrument to call to salah is not permissible, then to nationalism will be double more not permissible. But he says, what if you listen to a song, and then you replace the words that are directed to the human being, and you pretend like you're listening for them for Allah. So the guy says in the song in his sweet voice, I love you, and you say, oh, I'm directing this to Allah, right? So the scholars say, actually, you should... No, it's not permissible, because... Allah Azzawajal is greater than you to take the words of uh, I don't know يعني, uh, Christina Aguilera saying I love this guy to say oh I'm talking about Allah here يعني, Allah is greater than that so no it's not permissible Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallahu mubarak ala muhammad wa ala sahbihi ajma'in Zakumullah khairan I really sincerely thank you I usually don't have the habit of going over the time allotted but the topic was important the affliction is great really Zakumullah khair for being patient wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thank, Thank you for listening, listening to this presentation. presentation. For more, for more information, information, please, please visit, visit our, our website, website www.dawahcenter.com. The A-W-A-H Center.com. Just like Allah, Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.